This film presents the neurological examination of infants in the first week of life. In most instances, the normal responses are followed by examples of various types of abnormality which may be encountered. Primary remarks seem needed. First, this is clearly only one scheme of examination. The sequence in which the tests are done will of necessity vary somewhat from baby to baby depending on initial state. In some cases, other examinations not included here may need to be added. Secondly, the matter of interpretation is beyond the scope of a film of this length. In only a few instances are abnormalities clearly diagnostic or indicative for treatment. Other abnormalities may clearly be deviations from normal at the time, but may be transient and may be followed by entire future normality of the baby. In many cases, our present state of medical knowledge does not permit us either to explain the abnormality or give any prediction prognostically for the future. Many items of examination must be evaluated by observation of the infant at rest, preferably with minimal handling. The head is observed for the position of the eyes at rest. Spontaneous movements of the face are observed, and the palpebral fissures checked for width and equality. One abnormality to be looked for is the setting sun sign, as in this case of Kernicterus, which consists of the irides appearing to set beneath the lower lid, so that white sclera may be seen between the iris and the upper lid. Unequal palpebral fissures may be the most obvious physical sign of facial paralysis if the infant is not actively moving the face. This example is a rather drowsy infant with neonatal meningitis. This gun phenomenon consists of congenital ptosis in which the lid is automatically elevated each time the jaw is moved in sucking. Spontaneous movements of the body as a whole and of the limbs are observed. The character of the movements and the range of motion of the joints should be appraised. One should look for possible abnormal movements including tremulousness, spontaneous writhing movement, myoclonus or convulsions. In wordnig hollen disease, the baby is flaccid and aeroflexic. Respirations show bulging of the abdomen and retraction of the chest. Birth injury of the spinal cord superficially resembles wordnig hoffman disease. The abnormal posture of the arms is the most obvious difference, aside from other responses to be demonstrated later. The posture of the arms alongside the head is often one of the most initially striking features of Mongolism. Regular jerking, writhing movements are characteristic of many normal premature infants. The earliest observed fetal activity is often athetotic in nature, and this type of movement appears to persist for a time after premature birth. Jittery, tremulous activity may be seen spontaneously or may be obtained in response to almost any stimulus. Handling, sound, light, or eliciting the moral reflex may show the tremulous movements.
Unlike jitteriness, myoclonus is always an abnormal spontaneous movement. In this example, the pathologic basis is obscure, although the infant was subsequently microcephalic with spastic diplegia. The baby remained fully conscious and had a normal electroencephalogram. This is an example of convulsive movements in an unconscious baby with abnormal electroencephalogram. Neonatal convulsions are usually based on trauma or anoxia at birth or on chemical abnormalities. The causation in this case is obscure, but the disease was familial and presumably metabolic, although no abnormal substance could be identified in the urine. Abnormal posture of the left arm is obvious in this case of brachial palsy. However, it is not complete, as some movement can be obtained in response to pinprick. The blink reflex to light is tested with a Welch Allen light or a strong flashlight. Blinking should be obtained even if the baby's eyes are closed, unless the baby is crying so that the eyes are already held maximally closed. An absent blink reflex seldom indicates blindness, cortical or ocular. More often, as in this example, it is due to general depression of the central nervous system from anesthesia, anoxia, or other causes. Response to sound is tested with a wooden clacker. The response obtained may consist of a blink, a startled jump, or a moral reflex. This response is particularly hard to obtain in many instances, and should be repeated before one concludes that it is missing. Palmer grasping is tested by applying the examiner's finger firmly against the palm of the hand from the ulnar side. The Palmer grasp response may be absent for a variety of reasons, including Werdenig-Hoffman disease, as in this example. Plantar grasp is similarly tested, applying the finger to the sole of the foot near the base of the toes. The knee jerk is the only tendon reflex of major clinical value in most newborns. It is tested in the conventional manner, but the head should be in the midline at the time of testing. The knee jerk may be absent, as in this case of Werdenig-Hoffman disease, or from central nervous system depression due to anoxia or other causes. Exaggerated knee jerk is seen in this baby with myoclonus. Ankle clonus is best tested by pushing lightly against the sole of the foot, the entire leg being free in the air. Often none is obtained, but a considerable number of beats may be elicited in many normal infants. The average number of beats obtained should be recorded. This baby shows ankle clonus which is sustained for eight or ten beats, but nevertheless turned out to be entirely normal.
slower, more vigorous ankle clonus of greater amplitude is sustained indefinitely in this baby with generalized myoclonus. The rooting response is tested by touching each corner of the mouth and the upper and lower lip in the midline. The infant's head will normally follow in each direction, but sometimes movement of the face and tongue only is obtained. This reflex may be reinforced by previous testing of the sucking reflex if necessary. Sucking is tested with the examiner's finger in the infant's mouth, the finger being covered with a finger cot for sterility. Absent rooting response and very feeble sucking are seen in this case of congenital Werdenig-Hoffman disease. Another case of Werdenig-Hoffman disease, still active with incomplete atrophy, shows a visibly fasciculating tongue. The fasciculation is often most easily seen on the under surface of the tongue. Normally, when an infant is picked up and placed in the prone position with the head in the midline, the baby will lift up its chin, turn the head to one side, and make crawling movements with the feet and sometimes with the hands as well. The arm may be extended on the side toward which the head turns. Vertical eye movements may be evaluated by moving the head upward or downward. The eyes tend to remain fixed toward the examiner in a manner rather like the eyes of a doll. To test the labyrinthine reflex, the examiner holds the baby vertically facing him and turns first in one direction, then in the other. The effect can best be illustrated with a research apparatus which rotates baby and camera together at the same speed. During rotation, the baby looks ahead in the direction of rotation. stopping, the infant looks back in the opposite direction. Sometimes only forced deviation of the eyes is seen, but nystagmus is usually observed in vigorous mature infants. The tonic neck reflex is tested by turning the child's head slowly to the right or left and maintaining it in this position for about half a minute. The shoulders should be kept horizontal. A positive response consists of extension of the arm and leg on the side toward which the jaw is turned and flexion of the opposite limbs. There may be pelvic rotation in addition. No constant pattern is obtained in the majority of newborns, whether normal or not. This baby, who subsequently turned out to be entirely normal, shows fairly consistent tonic neck reflexes, particularly in the legs. Even these are not obtained on every occasion, however, and repeated rotation of the head is necessary to evaluate the response.
This drawing illustrates a strong obligatory response which the infant cannot overcome by struggling. This is abnormal at any age. The traction response is tested by lifting the infant from the supine position by pulling on his arms. There should be assistance from the baby's shoulder muscles, which can be felt by the examiner. When the infant is nearly to the sitting position, the head should be brought forward and there should be sufficient tone in the neck muscles to keep it from dangling helplessly against the chest at the end of the test. The traction response may be absent for a variety of reasons, as in this case of congenital Werdenig-Hoffmann disease. Mongolism, the traction response is also missing. The universal hypotonia becomes evident in testing this response. An asymmetric traction response, absent on the paralyzed side, is seen in a left-sided brachial palsy. Withdrawal response is tested by applying a pin to the sole of the foot. Facial evidence of pain should also be looked for, as failure to withdraw the stimulated limb may be due to either anesthesia or paralysis. The pin should be applied rather forcefully, as a gentle pin prick may elicit a response of extension rather than withdrawal. This baby with Werdenig-Hoffmann disease shows no withdrawal to pinprick, but there is clear evidence of pain in the facial expression. An automatic jerky withdrawal is seen in this baby with spinal cord injury. There is no evidence of appreciation of pain until the upper level of anesthesia is reached. A striking crossed extension reflex in the opposite limb may be seen in many cases of spinal cord injury. The tonic neck reflex may modify crossed extension. Automatic withdrawal and lack of appreciation of pain are clear in this other case of cord injury. The suggestion of crossed extension is only obtained when the infant is supported in the upright posture. Spontaneous stepping movements may be obtained in most infants if one supports them erect, placing the soles of the feet firm on the surface and inclining the trunk and head forward or intermittently from side to side. Most mature infants show these stepping movements at one time or another, but not on every occasion. To test the placing response, the infant is again supported in the erect position and the dorsum of first one foot and then the other is drawn upward against the under surface of the table edge. The baby should lift its foot upward and place it firmly on the table surface.
The placing reflex is poor and feeble in this baby, but he is quite normal except for being fatigued from a long examination. The placing response was vigorous on another occasion. The trunk incurvation reflex can be tested by stroking the paravertebral areas. It can also be evoked by pinching the skin just above the pelvic brim. The moral response can be tested in a variety of ways, but is most reliable and most complete when elicited by supporting the baby under back and head and letting the head drop back about 30 degrees. Normally, the arms first extend and then flex. The femora also flex on the pelvis in most cases. An absent moral reflex may be due to Werdenig-Hoffmann disease, or more often to depression of the central nervous system. An abnormal stiff type of moro is seen in Kernictrus. Brachial palsy produces an asymmetric moro. In this example, the paralysis is on the left. The right arm produces a normal moro response while the left arm fails to participate. The tone of the neck, trunk, and limbs has been evaluated during the previous examinations. It may be tested further by manipulation of the limbs. The baby should also be suspended in the supine, lateral, and prone position on the examiner's hand. Opus totinus, as in this case of Kernicterus, is best appreciated in the milder cases if the baby is placed on its side and attention directed at retraction of a head. In more severe cases, there may be hypertonus in all postures. Universal hypotonia is one of the most striking signs of Mongolism in the newborn. Genital contractures and limitations of motion are striking in this case of arthrogryposis multiplex congenita. This baby also has club feet which are treated by strapping. Completely flaccid legs with absent movement are seen with myelomeningocele. Transillumination of the head should be carried out in total darkness with a strong flashlight fitted with a light tight seal. One should attempt to transilluminate from occiput to forehead, against the baby's forehead, and from side to side. With the flashlight in any of these positions, but especially anteriorly, a faint glowing subcutaneous halo around the circumference of the flashlight is normal. Larger, irregular, and brighter areas may show the presence of an abnormality and indicate further testing. Side to side or back to front transillumination, when seen from the side opposite the flashlight, 
may appear as a total glowing over the entire head. Such an extended area is usually due to hydraencephaly. A normal head, of course, will transmit no light at all. The reaction of the pupils to light should be tested, noting the size of the pupils before the light is turned on and the speed of constriction. A congenital cataract usually appears as an obvious opacity in the lens, although there are several possible forms. Ophthalmoscopic examination is begun by inspection of the pupil, cornea, and lens, and followed by examination of the eye grounds in the conventional manner. Midriatic drops are required for adequate observation, and the assistance of a nurse is usually needed. If the examination has been done as part of the collaborative study of the National Institutes of Health, the last two items on the form concern conditions during examination and opinion as to normality. By conditions is meant the examiner's opinion whether or not a satisfactory impression of this baby was obtained. The diagnosis is an overall clinical impression of normality or abnormality. If a baby is believed normal in spite of certain deviations from the usual findings, these may be indicated in the round column. Finally, if a diagnosis of abnormality is based on inability to obtain an expected response normally present, one should clearly repeat the observation at the end of the examination or preferably on another occasion before concluding that it cannot be obtained.